Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I would like to talk to you about guns in space. Okay, so, back up. I play video games, and I also talk about science, and we do see a lot of video games with guns in space, but I'm really going to focus on conventional firearms, slug throwers as we like to call them in science fiction. Now, Infinite Warfare is a great example. They use a lot of conventional style weapons. However, I'm no firearms expert, but I'm pretty sure the weapons in Infinite Warfare are designed to be cool rather than realistic. As it turns out, military weapons designers have been considering the problems of firearms for some time. There's a declassified report from 1965 by Army engineers from the Future Weapons Office, and I think they deserve some kind of award for their title, which is Meanderings of a Weapon-Oriented Mind When Applied in a Vacuum such as the moon. Yes, they concerned themselves with what it would take to fight a war on the surface of the moon and what the soldiers would be armed with to be effective. Conventional firearms would probably work fine in space. I mean, they would at least fire. You know, bullets, they uh, have a propellant which includes an oxidizer rather like a rocket. Obviously, you know, your homemade potato cannon wouldn't fire. But any of the ammunition you would buy at pretty much uh, any sports store would work just fine. And I say any sports store as in I live in the US and you can buy guns at pretty much any sports store along with your basketballs and footballs that are strange shapes. Uh, yeah, I mean, it would probably fire just fine. Uh, in fact, the bullets would probably leave the barrel going a little bit faster because they didn't have to push the air out of the way. And hey, you probably wouldn't need to worry about gravity if you are in space, or you would need to worry about it less if you are, say, firing it on the surface of the moon. However, unmodified firearms will have problems in the vacuum of space, but these will be minor, at least initially. Firstly, there's the recoil. Good old Newton's second law, right? Equal and opposite reaction. When you fire a gun on Earth, you feel the kick and it will push you backwards. Now, if you move then to a lower gravity, you've got less weight holding you down. You have the same mass, but it means that you probably have, it's harder for you to, you know, resist this, right? It's not such a big uh, issue as you would imagine. I mean, guns are really designed to deliver lethal kinetic energy rather than lethal momentum. While the energy of a bullet is quite high, the momentum is typically about the same as a ball being thrown at you. I'm talking a football or a basketball, whatever you call a football. I mean, if you take, say, the M16 rifle, its slugs are about 3.6 grams and they're moving about one kilometer per second. So, you know, that turns out uh, that it would push you backwards at about two inches or five centimeters per second, assuming that you're about a 70 kilo individual. If you discharged the entire 30 round magazine, you would pick up a whole one and a half meters per second uh, reverse speed. That's about five uh, mile, five kilometers per hour. It's not a huge amount. A slightly more significant problem with the recoil would be the fact that when you fire a gun, you're lifting it up to your head and therefore the line at which you're firing is generally going through where your eye line is. And that generally doesn't line up with the center of mass of your body. So you're going to get a rotation. A single slug will probably uh, generate a few degrees of rotation. So discharging a whole magazine will be typically uh, turn, you know, speed you up to about 15 RPM, which would probably take you out of the firefight as you try to slow yourself down. And it's worth noting right now that a special type of gun was actually developed in the 1960s, which had a whole lot less recoil. Gyrojets, they don't fire conventional slugs, eh, conventional bullets. Instead, they fire miniature rockets, which is pretty darn awesome. They uh, leave the barrel relatively slowly, and the barrel actually has holes in it for the jet exhaust to come out. Once they leave the barrel, they get faster and faster and faster until they're about uh, 20 meters out, in which case they're going about Mach 1. And they're much bigger than conventional slugs, but the, uh, but the recoil is about one-tenth of what you'd expect. I mean, this is pretty cool. The, the gyrojets are awesome in so many ways. they called gyrojets, incidentally, because the little rocket exhausts on the rear are set up in such a way that they spin the bullet for stability. These actually appeared in the movie 
You Only Live Twice, which is one of my favourite Bond movies ever. You know, it has ninjas, and it was written by Roald Dahl. Yeah, you know Roald Dahl wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? He did the screenplay for that and helped introduce ninjas to the Western world. But yeah, I mean, these things, they're pretty rare, pretty collector's items. They never were necessary and they're very, very expensive to fire. I hear it costs like $100 per, per uh, round these days. Any real future space gunfight, the recall would probably be even less of an issue because if you're a smart person, the first thing you do is you get into cover. And from there, you probably have plenty of things to brace yourself against or hold on to to correct the very small amount of recall you get. And if you are some sort of badass trooper special forces that's flying across the gaps between spacecraft and your jetpack, well, guess what? Your jetpack is going to be smart enough to correct for the gun recoil. It will make you, keep you straight, and you won't have to worry about the small amount of thrust that uh, your gun is giving you. Anyway, the next major design consideration would be the thermal properties, or the thermal tolerances. Now, in space, the difference in temperature between shadow and direct sunlight could be very large. In the famous Meanderings report, they assumed a temperature range of minus 250 Fahrenheit to plus 250 Fahrenheit, and I'm not going to convert that to centigrade because I can't do that in my head, right? <laughs> Seriously, though, I mean, they probably overestimated this because they were designing, they were coming up with ideas, and they wanted worst-case scenarios. Now, one of the problems with such a large temperature range is that the temperature of the propellant will affect the way it burns, and they expected that they would have something like 25 to 50 percent difference in their uh, muzzle velocities depending upon how hot the weapon was. On top of that, every time you fire it, there is a chemical reaction in there that's generating hot gases, and these hot gases heat up the weapon. Now, if you have an automatic weapon, you're progressively heating up the barrel, and the weapons are designed so that they will be cooled down by the ambient air around it. In the vacuum, of course, there's no ambient air, so these things are going to get hotter faster, and it's much harder for them to get rid of the heat in the vacuum of space. Even if you were inside with an atmosphere, it's worth pointing out that the flow of air is in part driven by conven convection, and if there's no gravity, you will not have heat convection, and therefore your cooling will be different. So it's conceivable that a weapon designed to be fired in space might return to the good old days of water-cooled, or at least liquid-cooled weapons. And another area of concern which was covered by those meandering weapon-oriented nerds uh, was the problems faced by mechanical devices or any mechanical device operating in a vacuum. It, you may not know this, but in a vacuum, it's possible for similar types of metal to weld themselves spontaneously to each other. If you have two identical kinds without the barrier, the protective barrier of air, they will weld themselves together and stick. Similarly, there's also a problem with oil. Oil is used to lubricate all these mechanisms and, you know, keep them from touching. Well, the oil will also evaporate in a vacuum. Now, these are considerations, they're not insurmountable problems. There's ways to lubricate things, and there's also ways to make sure that the materials you're using are protected from the possibility of vacuum we uh, welding. But a d gun that was designed for use on the Earth would probably not have these considerations, and it's quite likely after firing a while, or, or firing a few rounds, or if it had been sitting in a vacuum for a while, that it simply wouldn't work reliably, or at least it wouldn't reload after the first shot. Finally, there's the ergonomics of operating a weapon while wearing a bulky pressure suit. The gloves on your typical spacesuit are really quite unwieldy things, and it's very unlikely you would be able to take a spacesuit glove and put it inside the trigger guard. So the designs that were offered in the, in the uh, meanderings paper, they actually featured wide triggers and no trigger guards so that they were easy enough to grasp and easy enough to operate, even if you were a Kerbal working with those mittens. So the whole point is, the regular guns would work just fine. You would just need to make them space ready. You would need to give them different triggers and make sure their mechanisms were secure against the rigors of deep space, of the vacuum and the temperature range. However, it's worth pointing out that firearms have in fact flown in space, and they've even visited the International Space Station. The TP-82 survival pistol was a standard part of every Soyuz survival kit. 
I mean, actually calling it a pistol is a bit misleading. It's more like a sawed-off double-barreled shotgun with a rifle under underneath. Uh, I mean, also you could launch flares from the shotguns. It was basically designed as a survival weapon. The butt could be taken off and uh, it would actually be a machete with a, a sheath, obviously, so you didn't slice your arm off when you're firing it. It was like a Swiss army knife of firearms. Now, the TP-82 was the brainchild of Alexei Leonov. If you remember, Alexei was, of course, the first man to walk in space on Voskhod 2. What you may have not remembered about Voskhod 2 was, uh, as they were finishing the mission, the guidance system failed, and they ended up landing in a remote part of Siberia in the middle of the forest. The astronauts had to spend the night in their capsule before they, they were uh, met by rescuers, and they were particularly worried that the local wildlife might be a little scary, especially since it was mating season. They did, in fact, have a 9mm pistol, but, as I understand it, Russian bears would probably just be made angry if you shot them with that. This experience convinced Leonov that something more appropriate needed to be carried on future missions. Now, as it turns out, NASA didn't really want to advertise the fact that there was a gun in space, and none of the astronauts that flew on the Soyuz have any photos of them training with it. But a couple of space tourists did. There are photos of Mark Shuttleworth and Anusha Ansari showing how it looks, and <laughs> I think these are pretty cool collector's items, to be honest. But yeah, they don't fly those anymore because they stopped making the ammunition in 1987 and 20 years later they decided, they decided it was basically past its sell-by date and they returned to using a 9mm pistol with all the problems of shooting bears not being a very good idea. Even more recently, the crews have started uh, voting on whether to carry the gun and as I understand, past a certain date no guns have been carried on the Soyuz, so space has been weapons-free for a while. Anyway, thankfully the use of these firearms in space has remained entirely in the realm of video games, and I hope it stays that way. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe. <laughs>